Hello and welcome everybody to Business 414 Globalization in Business. My name is Roland and I will be talking about how globalization has gone ugly today. And I want to start with a quote that says the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And that essentially means that no matter how good our intentions for our actions may be, there may be unintended negative consequences that are impacting on those whose life we want to improve. And in a time of global and instant news 24-7 all around the world, it is worthwhile to understand that while a lot of people have good intentions, not everybody has them. So a lot of people use this information for their own ends and needs without any kind of consideration for others. And even if the intentions of those who are using these news are good, there is no guarantee that the outcome will be positive for those affected. And the first topic for uh, the impact or the negative impact of globalization on Africa is the Fulani milkmaid or how the EU manages to destroy the African farming community. Uh, I need to begin with that up until about 2015, the uh, European Union enforced, had and enforced strict quotas on any agricultural products that were produced within the European Union, particularly on grains and dairy. So in practice, what, what had happened is that all the farmers in the European Union were told, this is how much grain, this is how much milk we are going to buy from you at a certain price. So you had a guaranteed price up to a number of units of produce that you could sell to a centralized organization and this organization had to buy from you from that price. So what happened then is obviously European farmers are very, very productive, second only to American farmers and American farmers advantage genuinely is that they have a lot more land to work with and a lot more lenient regulations that uh, they can use to produce more output in agriculture. So European farmers are hyper productive. So any kind of farmer, when you say, okay, your cow can produce, uh, or we will buy 10,000 liters per, uh, of milk per cow uh, that you have, and your cow, for whatever reason, gives 15,000 liters of milk, just as an example. So what are you doing with these 5,000 liters of overproduction? So what happened in the past is that these products were literally thrown away. They were donated to the United Nations, to other agencies that are trying to solve world hunger or sold cheaply outside the EU. In case of Africa, what happened is because there is so much production in the EU, the European farmers can produce any kind of agricultural goods for much, much less cost than farmers, for example, in Nigeria, Senegal, Burkina Faso, and so on. And initially, what was the idea of donating and cheaply selling this produce was preventing poor Africans from starving. And as much as some good has come from, has, has come from that, the negative knock-on effects are much worse in some people's opinion, while other people say, oh, the, the most important thing is that uh, nobody is starving. So ob obviously that equation doesn't fully work out. And we are not only selling, or the European Union is not only selling this products, these products to Africa, they are selling this to China, Japan, many, many other countries, particularly those that have a dairy deficit, for example, in Japan, the, most of the people can't digest any dairy products because they are lactose intolerant. So uh, naturally, they produce much less and have therefore 
potentially a need for these products. But when this product goes on sale in Africa, it does a lot of uh, it does a lot of damage. And just looking at the extent, and this uh, is the value of products in the area of dairy, eggs, and honey, all kinds of edibles that are being sold by the European Union to Nigeria alone. And we can see that initially when 2015 the quotas were dropped, that there was a lot less sold than 2014 and prior. But it has come up again in recent years with no impact visible due to the pandemic that is, uh, seems to be apparent. And at the last year, 2021, it is $275 million worth of goods being sold to Nigeria. And these products have all kinds of negative outcome. We are going to look more at what kind of products are being sold in the, in the dairy section and how these products are used locally in the practice session on Wednesday. So what happens here is that uh, in 2016, uh, a research paper was published and on page 34, there is a summary of the perceived impact that dropping the quotas would have on actual farmers in Nigeria and Africa. And one of the one of the first conclusions is that uh, it was unlikely to decrease motivation for local farmers, and uh, this is this is a bit of uh, of a bummer because it has impacted on local farmers a lot. And whether you are motivated or not, when you're pushed out of business, you, you are out of business, and you have lost you have lost that portion of your income. So what? We need to understand what, or what uh, was not understood properly at that time is that a lot of farming in Africa is not primarily an economic activity, but a traditional occult and cultural activity, for example, of the migrant Tuareg farmers. We also understood that there won't necessarily be a positive impact on prices. So selling cheap products to those communities in Africa has not brought prices down in the extent that it should have. And there's many reasons why it hasn't done so. So for once, uh, as, a positive, as a positive side note on this, on this idea, a lot of European companies like Arla have invested very heavily in Africa and are starting to call or have started to collaborate with local industry to improve the products and to ens ensure food security. However, what it has done is it has alienated a lot of people from fresh local products. So imagine when you are trying to ship dairy products from Europe to Africa. You're going to do that on a ship. You're not going to fly these products over. It's uneconomical. You can't just take liquid milk, put it on a ship, and expect it to be still be fresh and usable when it arrives in Africa. So what is happening is that in Europe, these fresh products are turned into milk powders, shipped to Africa, where they are being reconstituted into liquid product and sold as milk or processed into goods like quark, yogurt, and so on. And young people in Africa that have grown up with these kind of products, they are potentially separated, alienated from fresh local products. So imagine a young person in Lagos, Nigeria, that has never seen a cow in their life, but buys products like yogurt, like milk, in the local supermarket that are produced from European powders and then processed in Africa. 
What we have also seen is, and what we also predicted, is a particularly large impact on women. So traditionally, a lot of this farming is done by women in African communities. And taking this kind of livelihood away from them, traditionally, yeah, what, is, what is the new role of, of women when their traditional role is being substituted and replaced by a foreign product? So there is massive, uh, massive potential social impact and massive uh, social change inbound for this very simple transaction of selling products to another country. So what we, uh, what we uh, summarize and conclude is that while there is initially a positive impact like ensuring food security, enhancing choice of consumers, there is a long-term profound negative impact by pushing local farmers out of business because they simply can't compete with cheap European products, pushing them out because young people prefer those products that are having these European powders as a starting ingredient instead of fresh local products, impact on women and their livelihood, and essentially a development that has not been well understood or maybe even ignored by those businesses and the positive effects from European farmers collaborating with African farmers for a more localized and better quality product for the people while ensuring food security has not necessarily fully materialized. So what can we say about that? Uh, there has been a profound impact on local industry, undoubtedly. For example, one case study emphasized on the massive energy cost that a local dairy farmer had, basically pushing him out of business because he can't compete. Large EU conglomerates like Arla are buying themselves into an underdeveloped market that allows them to sell their overproduction in one uh, jurisdiction in another jurisdiction and the reaction from local politicians has been a mixed bag. For example, one of the more conscious dealings with this was when Kenya imposed a 60% import tariff on any foreign dairy products. The problem is the local industry simply cannot compete with the foreign industry due to cost advantages. Now, these cost advantages are for various reasons. For example, lack of infrastructure in Africa. And this is something that European conglomerates have been trying to address by building factories in Africa, by improving market access for local subsistence farmers and making sure all this milk is collected and processed within the country instead of using powder products from another country. So what could we do potentially? We could formalize market access and ensure that people have access to this. So as I said, if milk is not collected, what, what are people going to do with the milk they can't drink immediately or process immediately? Well, it gets thrown away. And particularly if you're, if you're saying, uh, well, we are, we are doing this to make sure nobody in Africa is starving. And then we are not only throwing food away to a massive degree in Europe, but we are starting to throw away food in the countries that we say is lacking food security. It, it doesn't make sense, does it? So when these local conglomerates invest into processing and uh, infrastructure so that the milk can be collected and processed, this milk that is now being collected and processed locally replaces then the uh, instant products, the powder products that are being imported. And that is, act that is actually a good thing. What we could also do is we could subsidize local products and make sure that people want to use local products instead of products that are being made by imported powder products by putting very high tariffs on finished goods 
and precursor products like milk powder, but impose very low tariffs on liquid milk, for example. So when we look at that, what we are doing economically is we are incentivizing value adding industries and helping the local industry moving further up in the supply chain. Instead of providing raw materials, they are encouraged to vertically integrate and offer finished products instead of importing goods that can be used as precursors to the finished good. So in practice, we will need a combination of both. And I want to summarize this situation as, uh, as follows. Under the pious label of food security, particularly G7 organizations, leave the high pressure competitive environment domestically and dominate all market contenders in underdeveloped localities like in Africa, like in Asia. And having this massive advantage and avoiding the hard competition in Europe, they are establishing a new market for themselves and dominate the competition in that market. Now, the second topic I want to talk about is the so-called green economy myth. And the green economy myth is starting with e-waste is a problem. E-waste is electronic wastes like your old smartphone, computers, TVs, all kinds of electronic products that we are using. And after using them for a couple of years, we throw them away because it costs more to repair them and the technology has moved on so much further that we want a new product instead of fixing the old one. It's actually cheaper to buy a new printer, for example, than to buy new ink cartridges. And that is, as a situation, totally counterintuitive, right? So electronic waste is the fastic, fastest growing type of waste across the EU and only 42.5% is being recycled. Now this is actually a world record. Every single other jurisdiction has a lower recycling rate of that. But even now and with strict laws in place that say you have to recycle 45 tons per 100 tons of electronics sold in the previous three years, only 42.5% is recycled. So we are not even meeting our target. So what do we do with, with that trash instead? We are selling the predominant amount of trash that is hazardous, toxic, and yeah, a, a matter for throwing it, throwing it away because it's too expensive to actually do something with it to developing countries like and particularly Ghana. I have attached a couple of uh, readings about this toxic waste dump in Akboblochi, Ghana, and it goes to show that there is a little bit more than a good idea of a green economy and maybe not all outcomes are bad and even the bad outcomes are giving us opportunity to create something good. So what we can say is that the green economy in the EU is causing massive environmental destruction abroad in Ghana, in China. And the health hazards for those performing the work in countries where there is no proper medical facility to deal with that or the medical facilities that are available are so expensive that it is not possible for these people to access medical facilities. Um, on the other hand, it does provide a work opportunity for undereducated young people. So when economic necessity mandates that you, that you work, you will do all kinds of work that you actually can do. And if you do not have the education, for example, to sit in a bank and provide financial advice for a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, salary, you are doing work that requires less skills. And this has been the first thing uh, that we need, we need to look at in globalized environmental management. So 
what what has happened with this toxic waste it, it is a fact and exporting the problem makes us look good in the eu but it doesn't solve the underlying problem of the toxic waste it does still exist and creates massive knock-on effects in the countries where where we are exporting this to there's a number of countries that have recently passed laws that you can no longer export your toxic waste to these countries that it cannot be imported so if if uh, toxic waste shows up in these countries and is received in the ports the, the ships is, the ships are being sent back period so what we need to look at is uh, that globalization establishes a weakest link principle so if i look at this from the eu's point of view is uh which other country would accept this trash there will be one so when skill requirements for the working population is increasing and no skill or low skill labor pays less and less money it is no longer very economically worthwhile to perform these activities domestically and we're trying to outsource them so we are sending the toxic waste to ghana for example where people that make a lot less money have an opportunity to do what we don't want to afford to do and earn a livelihood so in practice what happens is even kids uh, in ghana are collecting this trash burn the wires and take the copper and sell it to a metal dealer which is making them about two dollars a day that is a 2018 figure and looking at the economic prospects is that it's an opportunity for people that have low or no skills that are required in the marketplace on the other hand it creates a number of health hazards for these people you can imagine that it is pretty dangerous to first of all go to these places and collect this trash you, do, you don't know uh, what kind of toxic chemicals metals and stuff um, are going into your body by simply just collecting these then the health hazard of when you are burning this kind of trash in order to get the metal parts out of it you release all kinds of toxic gases that are affecting your health and are detrimental for your life expectancy if nothing else so what what happens is that a lot of these kids are getting sick and go back to the village where they are from and yeah live a miserable life until they die so what has happened or one of the things that has happened is that uh, a german society entered uh, entered ghana as an extension to the uh, chamber of commerce and trade and started teaching these young people how to avoid certain health hazards and generally perform this work more healthily and by processing this trash in a different kind of fashion not only makes it a little bit healthier but also increases the amount of trash they can process and therefore their income so uh, while not everything is bad the real question behind this is uh, to what extent does one action and a good outcome justify the bad outcomes here but we are going to talk about these things more in the practice session also for the food security part of of this session and hopefully have a fruitful discussion of is this is this actually uh, justifiable or is there a better solution that does not compromise on either side of the desired outcome so essentially what we need what we need to ask in our session on wednesday is is business actually the solution to development of a nation or is Roderick correct assuming that development of a nation is predominantly a domestic question for the local governments and business should have no role in that or business has only the role that 
the local polity grants them to do. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be seeing you on Wednesday. Have a nice day.